What's up, peers, and I welcome you to join the Wasabi Cast. My name is Max Hillebrand, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Dan Wellmsley, one of the early contributors of Wasabi Wallet. And he actually has his background in tinkering on hardware uh, and the electronics therein, uh, fire detectors and all other cool stuff, and eventually writing graphical user interfaces to manage these. This let him down into uh, contributing to what is now called Avalonia Framework. And we talk a bit about that past and uh, their process of developing this beautiful free software graphical user interface framework. Then ultimately, uh, about how Adam Fiskor and Napara reached out to him to come on to the Wasabi bandwagon and help to save the demo of the building on Bitcoin conference, where Adam, Lucas, and Dan sat together for three weeks in Lisbon, uh, Portugal, to hack on first Wasabi Wallet 1.0 user interface. Uh, for me personally, still to this day, quite very pretty. Um, but over these last two years, it kind of shows his age and especially a feature creep. So Dan is now, well, he's gathered a team of five uh, user interface developers, a couple UX researchers, uh, and specifically UI designers to make Wasabi Wallet 2.0 so beautiful and so smooth that everyday users can intuitively use it to protect their privacy by default. Was that because this was a beautiful, interesting conversation, uh, and I very much uh, enjoyed it and learned a lot about Dan's history and his motivation and why he contributes to free software and Wasabi. Uh, I will not hold you any longer. Enjoy the show. So, Dan, I'm, I'm very curious how you actually got into developing software itself and, and what motivates it, you to, to start writing code. So, uh, well, I have a long history in software. And actually, when I, uh, when I was studying, I actually studied electronics. But then all the companies that I worked for, every time he was building some electronics, everybody needed some software to run the electronics or they, they needed some software to control it hook it up to a PC, a little UI to control some custom hardware. So I ended up becoming the guy that usually was responsible for that. I, I sort of found that I had a, a knack for software, and that's how I uh, kind of got into it. And um, over time, I did less and less electronics and more and more software. Oh, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So you're coming from the hardware side. Uh, what type yeah, of which, hardware yeah. project was that? Sorry, say again? What type of hardware uh, projects were that? Oh, I mean, I've worked on all kinds of stuff. Uh, like um, in the beginning, it was like sort of, uh, you know, like fire alarms, but it was for like an industrial things where like toxic gases could get released. Later on, I was working in touchscreen industry. So I've been to um, Taiwan and seen where they make all the iPhone touchscreens and all that kind of stuff. Um medical equipment, um, something more related to what we, we do now. Uh, I've worked on payment terminals where you put your card in and put your PIN number and it talks to the banks and things like that. So all kinds of stuff. Okay, very interesting. Um, and I, I always kind of thought that hardware is always more leaning towards closed source proprietary uh, architectures or designs. Um, but now, of course, you work on in free software. Uh, so... Did you ever consciously think about that dilemma back in the days when you were still working in hardware? Yeah, in fact, uh, um, yeah, that's a really good point and an interesting topic. So, in um, when you're actually developing electronics, a lot of the uh, the CAD tools that they use are pro pro uh, proprietary, and uh, um, I, I think it's fair to say that that industry is quite. It doesn't move very fast in terms of like the tools and and stuff to to, to use it. So. A lot of companies that I uh, would work for, you would get clients would sort of insist that, you know, a schematic or a circuit was built on a particularly, particular uh, package that was well, maybe well known and usually very, very expensive. And uh, now there's some quite good open source things available that can fulfill that gap. But the sort of mentality in the industry is if you're not paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for a license, then it's, it's not good. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then, um, as well, in terms of developing software for electronics, um, again, the, a lot of the vendors, at least back in the days when I started it, they would, 
they usually want to charge you a, a license for a compiler or an IDE. And in, in fact, probably that was my entry into, uh, into open source software was that after a while, you know, I was sort of getting sick of it and I, I, I had to go at making my own IDE that was um, used open source compilers and cross platforms and had some cross platform tooling and uh, allowed you to sort of build software for um, embedded software for microcontrollers things like that um but as easy as it is in the in the desktop world and you know it, it never uh, really came to anything I, me and some of my colleagues were, were using the, those tools but you have to really put in I mean, I, I did put in several years into developing this stuff, but to really get it adopted, you have to dedicate so much time and, and effort. And that wasn't something that I, uh, I didn't have quite enough resource to, to see it through. Um, but that was, that's what, that's my, that was my gateway into open source, um, software and, and, and open source UI software as well. Yeah, I imagine it must be like excruciating like, to make you furious um, when you are tinkering on hardware and you try to figure something out, but there is no documentation, no way for you to actually get to the source file and, and to figure out what's actually going on. Like That must cost so many nerves. Yeah, but um, I mean, there's been products that I've worked on where, you know, there's a new technology. Um you, you can buy something in and, and you, you do like a reverse engineering, you know, you, 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 um, use like oscilloscopes and you can probe around. And if you got, you can usually work out how some new technology is working and you can learn a lot quite quickly with that and then find that way how to adapt it for some other use and stuff. So it, although you don't have the, the sort of the source code for the design, you can, in a way, it's, I guess, the probing around, you can sketch out the, the schematic and find out how it works, and it's almost like decompiling, you know? So we, we always have that option. It's probably Yeah, a, kind of like a, reverse engineering. Yeah, it's probably a lot easier to do that in hardware than it is actually in software. Oh, that's interesting. Why is that? Um, just because you can, you can take, it's something physical, you can, you can take it apart, you can look at it, you can see what's there. It's only once you get down to the sort of silicon level where everything's inside a chip that you, it's that then it becomes almost impossible. But um, you know, you can see all the resistors, capacitors, chips. You can see what the signals are doing. So it's not a it's not a completely closed box. Um, I guess with software, there's lots of techniques to prevent people from doing things like that. But sometimes, you know, like closed software, even if you can maybe decompile the source code, they'll scramble all the Function names. Uh, it's called obfuscation to make it very, very difficult. So, um, yeah, I don't know. In my opinion, it's easier to do it with hardware to reverse engineer that. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, at least you have something to look at, <laughs> right? Yeah, and and yeah. to touch. And, and software wise, I always think it's easier just to actually look at the, you know, if it's a UI software, depend, you know, you can usually, it's not worth the effort of, reverse engineering you can just see how it works and produce something better anyway oh yeah right especially with ui i guess reverse engineering uh, it can be done on multiple levels because you see the result uh, of, of the computation uh, so you might figure out the computation that gets you there yeah yeah and 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 if you've got you know and if you're in the open source world you know they just give you the source code don't they you know and it benefits everyone so I much prefer working in that way, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Me too. Um, so you, you, you eventually got to writing u graphical user interfaces for these hardware projects. Um, but, uh, then you eventually got to, to Avalonia. Uh, so what is actually that project and how did you discover it? Yeah. So, I mean, when, when I first got to it, uh, it wasn't called Avalonia. It was called Perspex and it was, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I tried to write a, an IDE, but the problem was that the IDE that I'd written would only run on Windows. And a lot of embedded software, and especially in the, the open source sort of sector of that, people are using Linux. Some people are using Mac. And 
if it can't run there, then a lot of the enthusiasts that might be able to contribute to, to that area and not necessarily that interested. So, um, it was how do I get the, the effort that I've already put into this and how do I make it run cross platform? And obviously the, the easiest thing is to try and find out if somebody's made a cross platform version of the framework that you're using. So the technology I was using was, um, framework called WPF, which is a Microsoft technology. And it is very good even now. Um, you know, I, I, I personally believe that they, they have failed to replace it with something better. So I, I still use that technology if it's for Windows only applications. And, um, uh-huh. so, so do, what exactly is WPF and why is it only for Windows? Uh, it's Windows presentation framework. Um, so, uh, on, on Windows, the, um, the first sort of, um, UI framework where they, you could sort of drag and drop buttons onto a, a form and, um, double click it to get the code where you could type the code there. What happens in to the button was Windows Forms. Um, Windows Forms. Oh, form that's cool. So you kind of, you Sorry. build the graphical user interface inside the graphical user interface, basically. Yeah, that was like the origin, that was like the origins of, like it, it originally came from um, Visual Basic. Um, and then Wind, Wind Forms was like the more modern version of that and you know, worked with different languages and things like that. And then Windows Presentation Framework was like a, a modern, um, framework that was maybe it was originally intended to replace Wind Forms or it was certainly designed to have more capabilities. So. Um, it enables things like um, you, you you can render a control to lock in where you want, rather than um, you know a button just having a fixed lock, and it's like what a Windows button. You can have the original lock, or you can completely replace it. Um, but that technology was completely tied to Windows, so it was a great technology, but it needed to be cross-platform, well, at least for for me. So mm-hmm. uh, fortunately for me. Um, uh, a guy called, turned out a guy called Steven had, um, been reverse engineering WPF and it's a huge co- code base. Was it closed source at the time, WPF? Yes, it was. It is now open source, but at the time it was closed source. So when I say reverse engineering, like finding out how it, how it's actually working underneath. So you, you can usually, you can get clues of that from using the framework, seeing how the code, the public APIs work and things like that. So. Basically, that's, uh, Stephen had, had, had done a proof of concept. I think it probably just had like a button and you could make a button run on, um, Linux and Windows. And there was a few other people, it piqued a few other people's interest and they, they started getting involved. And, and before you know it, people were contributing controls and, and it was, this was way back in, I think it's been about eight years now. So. Or maybe six years. I'm not sure. It's been, this was a long time ago. And, um, it, so it, it's taken a long time, but you know, back then you couldn't have gone, let's build the Sabi one on it because, you know, you would, you would be able to make a tiny little bit of progress on the UI and then you would have some problems. You know, it was nowhere near production ready. Um, and me building the IDE on it, I was sort of accepting that. Okay, this framework wasn't going to be ready for me, but I can go as far as I can with the IDE. And when I bump into a roadblock, I can go, Hey, um, I need to fix this for you. How can I fix this? Or does this control missing? How, uh, how should we build this control? Or this doesn't work. How can I fix it? Or, or maybe they would fix it. And then, um, it just became like that. Um, more and more people got involved and things just started going really quickly and. Eventually, after a couple of years, you had something that was fairly stable and, and worked. You know, there were still some limitations, but if you worked within those, it would work. So, yeah, oh, that's, that's awesome. how I kind of got dragged into Avalonia. <laughs> uh-huh. a, a quick aside, two questions of definition. What is an IDE and what is a framework, actually? So IDE is for Integrated Design Environment. Um. Yeah, programmers basically, it's like a, a program that usually you have a code editor in the middle and some tools around, around the side that help you like navigate, um, code or show you a preview of 
what your code's going to generate on um, controls for debugging the code that you're writing. So it's like an all-in-one solution. So yeah, that's why it's like an integrated design environment. So kind of a bit like a like a text editor that automatically renders what's going on. Yeah, it's like a text editor, but it's got a lot more bells and whistles around it, mm. and, and all integrated into one um, solution. Okay, cool. And then what is a framework? So a framework is say is in in software. Obviously, most people know that software um, comes in varying degrees of complexity and um uh, a, f a framework is say um it's like i guess you could explain it as it's like a, a layer or um a, a base that you can build something a foundation that you can build something on top of so um if you want to build um a ui you need to get the button from somewhere and you need to have the ability to place that button somewhere in the window and say what happens when that button is clicked on. Now, you could start writing some software tomorrow and you could write all the code for a button and all the code to draw a button, but then are you really doing what you want to do? Because what you really want to do is make a, an application for your new shiny mm -hmm. phone wallet. And if you're spending all your time writing the code just to do the button or what happens um, or, or to hook the button up to what happens when the user clicks on it, then that, that's like reinventing the wheel. So mm -hmm. whenever you're building an application for a Mac or iOS or, or Windows or Linux, usually you are building it on top of some platform or framework which provides all of those things. Um, so... Yeah, that's kind of what a framework is. It's something that you, it's it's there, and you can fill out. It gives you all the all the components that are necessary to build an application without being an application. Uh -huh, that's you interesting. The, you you sort of put the meat on the bones. Uh huh. You know? So you kind of have like the the shape of a button, maybe even uh, or like the the functionality, the the animation, what happens when you click on it, that it, for example, goes a bit gray or something. But a framework does not include the name of the button or maybe even the color of the button. Yeah, so it, it probably doesn't um, contain the text what it says on the button, and it probably and it doesn't usually contain what actually happens when the user clicks the button. It's everything up until that point. So you can you can turn the application, the actual functionality, what we would call the I guess the the business logic of your application. You know what it what it does, you know, this is an application for um, managing Bitcoin or this is an application for editing text. They both probably somewhere got buttons in them, but they do completely different things. So, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, really nice. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, in the early days of Avaloon, it was basically a one-man project and then some few other contributors, including you, uh, started to contribute to it. And it kind of picked up steam and more and more uh, people got into this. Um, and I think this is like, this is one possible outcome with free software. But can you speak a bit more about, uh, both the challenges, uh, of that such a open contribution model actually had? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that in the early days when you're, when you're working on this, it, it can take quite a long time before. Before you get momentum, so you might have one. You might be on your own, or you might have managed. If you're lucky, you might have managed to attract another person. Or if you're really lucky, maybe you've got two people there from the beginning. Because usually in the beginning, everybody's doing the work voluntarily, and uh, and so it relies on people's uh, spare time, and people. Uh, it, Often, unless it's something that's very, very valuable to them, people won't spend the time. So you've got to find those people that your project is valuable to. And when you're not very well known, it's harder to, to find those people. Uh -huh. So it, you have to, uh, you have to believe in what, what it is, know that it's, it's valuable to people. And 
eventually they you will find the the, the, the people that will will help but it, it can take a long time so yeah definitely in the early days that was challenging and there's some points when you think you know am i wasting my time here or um is this ever going to to work out and you know eventually it did but it did take a long time before you it can take a long time before you see the the rewards yeah so. yeah right with free software this is such a voluntarist uh, based ecosystem you scratch your own itch right and you only work on the problems that are actually meaningful to you uh, and of course you know when you're the only one working on a free software project well presumably it's an important problem for you to solve because that's why you're working on it but then if nobody joins you to fix that problem well is it really a pressing problem right if nobody else thinks it's worth to spend their time on well maybe it's not that important of a problem and maybe yes you're wasting your time uh, so yeah that can be quite difficult when in the early days there is seemingly no interest right no other contributors coming in uh you maybe start doubting yourself yeah sure um I mean, in in our case, we always knew that some people are going. We we knew that people would be more interested once it gets to a point where they can use it without too many limitations or too many issues. So I think we always we had some moments when we were doubting doubting ourselves, but you know, we we still we always reminded each other we knew that it was something that was was worthwhile. Um, I mean, it was an obvious one as well because. It, 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 people were literally demanding Microsoft make it cross-platform, and unfortunately, it, it, that, it's not really very plausible for them to make WPF cross-platform without spending a lot of effort. And they they sort of moved on to other stuff. So, and even now that it's open source, I, I can't see see that happening. They're, they're sort of investing in, in other technologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so WPF was not cross-platform and closed source, at least back in the days. And yeah. so Avalonia kind of tried to fill that niche, right? A, a open source framework that is cross-platform. And then that's, yeah. yeah. So we, 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 with Avalonia, we created something that was essentially very much like WPF, very similar, very compatible, so people could easily move to it. But at the same time, um, you know, WPF was uh, a mature framework. People knew what they liked about it and what they didn't like about it and we were free it was almost like if we were the people that developed wpf we've been told now everything that you've learned from building it you can and using it you can start from the beginning and not make those mistakes so with avalonia Uh it was an excellent opportunity to fix all the problems with it or at least the fundamental issues and we certainly managed to make some some improvements but at least we did that (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of nice to refactor uh, from the ground up and start with a fresh, a fresh slate uh, and an empty page, uh, especially when you have the background in what worked, what didn't work, uh, what can we improve. Um, yeah, that that seems to be quite a, a promising approach, indeed. Yeah, and, I guess we had the we had the benefit of hindsight that mm-hmm. that they didn't have in the beginning, and yeah, we just I guess it was an an advantage to us when. We, you can go cross platform, but also at the same time, you get all these extra things that are easier to to use and, and extra yeah. features. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, when do you think that the project reached a point where it was quote unquote production ready, like where you were comfortable that people use this in their other projects? Or is it even at that point now? <laughs> well, um, I'd say a few years ago, um, it was, you could, it became production ready provided you were able to accept um a certain amount of um testing you know so as long as you could do testing Avalonia didn't have to provide you some guarantees that things were just going to work um and you could also um live with you know some things are not going to work and you're going to need to get a bug fixed or or fix it yourself. And for some of the early early people, that um, that sort of risk was worth it because being able to have cross platform, the cross platform .NET UI was more valuable than than those. But it got to the point where those kind of 
issues and stumbling blocks that people would have were not so drastic that it was just completely untenable anymore. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're really sort of talking around the time not too long before uh, Wasabi uh, got involved with Avalonia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems that roughly at that point where you got comfortable enough with Avalonia, um, Adam Fiskor and Opara was tinkering on Hidden Wallet. Um, that back in that day it had a uh, electron uh, graphical user interface uh, with a bunch of JavaScript and stuff. Um, and then he wanted to kind of redo that and, and look for uh, like a, a, a new approach to the graphical user interface. Um, and I, I know that this is then where he reached out to you and, and started talking uh, to you, but uh, can you rehash these early days when Nopara reached out and, and what actually happened here? Yeah, so um, with Avalonia we have like a public uh, chat that people ask questions, um, you know, how does this work, or I'm struggling with this, and um, it's like a little community that people help each other, and now there's tens of thousands of users in there. But um, back in that day, uh, Adam uh, contacted me and and said um, that they were interested in using Avalonia, and he had a few questions about how it worked and things like that, so I responded and... And and at this time as well, the the IDE that I that I built it it was sort of built into like a a shell, so you you didn't have to have all the IDE parts along with it. You could just use that as a a, a kind of like a UI that was sort of ready to go, and you could add in your own pages, tabs, and controls. And um, Adam had had seen that, and you could see that. It was something that would enable you to build an application quite quickly. Um, so um, Adam talked with me about that and told me that it was for a Bitcoin wallet. And you know, at the time, I didn't re- really know very much about Bitcoin. You know, I, I I'd obviously heard about it and I would sort of played around with it a, a little bit, but I didn't understand uh, how it works or the sort of consequences of it and things like that and um so at some point uh adam sort of proposed to me that he needed to to build this bitcoin wallet and he wanted to make it happen quite quickly but he needed people that knew how to build things with avalonia correctly um in a maintainable and scalable way and so he offered for me to um, meet with him and um, we could sort of build the early version of it together. Now, at this point, I was in a full-time job, so my time was quite limited. And um, I was actually planning a holiday in Portugal. So Adam said, oh, well, I'll fly to Portugal and meet you there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, well, well, let me have a week week's holiday, and then I'll meet you in in Lisbon. That's great. So it was it really was then a rather uh, swift decision and and swift action taking. Um, but at at this point, uh, like, did you think that the Bitcoin is completely crazy and that it's just this random side hobby, or did you really think that this might be a future industry where you can make well your own profession? Uh, at this point, I didn't. You know, I didn't know. Um, I did, I never I was never thinking oh you know this was going to become a full time job or anything like that I just thought okay you know this is going to be interesting um, Avalonia the more at that point um, I only had a couple of people building stuff on it at least that would actually be used by people and to get um, with Adam um, what wanting to use Avalonia to to build another app on there. Um, for me, the interest was helping him do that so that Avalonia could have more, could start getting more, um, apps developed on it and, 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 and more, uh, more people using stuff based on Avalonia. Um, but I wasn't expecting anything more to come of it at that point. Mm-hmm. I see. Very nice. And then how was that time, uh, in Lisbon? Uh, because if, if I remember, it was, um, the breaking Bitcoin conference there and both Lucas Ontivero and Adam Fixor uh, were there in person. Um, and 
uh, Adam told us in, in episode one of this podcast that he was really like frustrated because Wasabi was almost ready under the hood, but the graphical user interface was completely missing. Uh, and he wanted to demo something at the Breaking Bitcoin conference. <laughs> well, but demoing something with other graphical user interfaces is kind of boring. <laughs> so uh, how was how was that a week or two? Uh, and, and how do you remember that kind of hackathon? Yeah, so um, it was the Building on Bitcoin conference in whichever year it was now. Was it 2018? And... Might have been. I can't remember the exact thing. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> Yeah, so well, I I uh I met up with uh, Adam and Lucas as well, and I was like pretty impressed. And I was like, "Well, these guys have flown, you know, from the other side of the world to to meet me to find out about Avalonia." You know, I was like, and and this was kind of like the first time I'd met anybody that um in person um from the sort of Avalonia community or anybody that was building anything with Avalonia. So you know, for me, it was like a pretty exciting adventure in, in, in its own. They're actual uh, humans using Avalonia, not just yeah. dogs in cyberspace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also now it's more than just some um, some people that you just type in a box to, you know. These are like actual personalities that you get to know and yeah, that was that was really nice for me. And yeah, so Adam sort of tried to explain the concept of what he was doing and and what it was, and obviously for somebody that is new to Bitcoin, obviously it was a lot to take in, didn't fully understand it at first, but um, I could see that, as you say, he basically built a lot of the, the code to actually, he'd actually done all the engineering and the research to actually implement all this stuff, and it was basically missing the UI, so it, it basically, um, we were in like a, a small flat, um, and me and Lucas would sit around the, the kitchen table and Adam would sort of told us his ideas about how the UX might work and um, we just went at it like one piece at a time and it was pretty intense. We were working really fast, you know, to to, to, to put stuff together. I think it might have been three, three weeks from um, nothing until we had something that was at least demonstrable um and functional um but i mean that would if if adam hadn't already done all the work that he'd done i mean three weeks would be impossible for for that Mm -hmm. so you know a lot of the really important stuff had already been done and it was mainly purely building the ui and yeah and, and and it was really good because obviously i had so many questions about um Bitcoin, you know, I just had to be like a sponge learning everything and we, we would sort of go for these uh, long lunches, me and Lucas and Lucas would tell me absolutely everything that he knows and he'd sit there and I was asking him probably the same question to anybody that's new is, is asking, you know, over and over again and he was really patient and he'd explain everything in detail and, and, and that was really, really, that was really cool for me, you know, just to, to yeah. find that out. Yeah, I imagine if, like, in your situation, knowing pretty much nothing about Bitcoin and then having the monumental task of writing the user interface for a Bitcoin mm-hmm. wallet, if you would do that while only talking to the others in cyberspace via chat, I did that would maybe even be impossible, but for sure a bunch more work. Uh, so to be able to sit together to to have a lunch and to chat for hours, uh, I assume that really saved you a lot of time, both in understanding Bitcoin and then acting upon it and actually writing the UI of a Bitcoin wallet. Yeah, definitely. Um, being, there's, there's no substitute for getting everybody actually there face-to-face and, and, and doing that. You know, it's just so much more um, effective. But um, yeah, it, it was kind of like that. And, and then we'd be just working non-stop, writing the code, writing the UI and, uh, and stuff. And, and as well, you have to remember that at that time, we sort of were taking something, an existing UI, and then um, adapting it for Bitcoin Wallet. So it was, it was kind of like, even with the UI, we were not starting from from scratch, you know. So that helped what, a little bit. What was that project that you, uh, that you kind of forked? Yeah, it was based on the um, the the IDE that I talked about before that I, that I'd written for Avalonia. 
Um, the the idea was called Avalon Studio. Um, <laughs> so we basically sort of um, used that. You know, if you if you ripped out all the coding stuff and it had some an, an area for the tabs, which if you use Wasabi One up today, you'll know that there's there's tabs in there and there's a side sidebar bar where you can manage your wallets. So that's where all that structure sort of we were able to just take that as it was. Ah, um, but, but like your IDE was kind of the the ground layer for the first Wasabi UI. I didn't know that. Cool. Yeah, it's. I think it, the the sort of coding teams we call it the the shell of um of Wasabi. Yeah, so that's what it was. That's where it came from. Yeah, and I assume that when you've actually done the work on this UI for, uh, on this IDE. You kind of knew it inside and out, and that helped you also to, um, well, to adapt it, right? Yeah, yeah. For me, it was very, very easy and quick to do that, and I could quickly show Lucas and Adam. You know, this is how it works. This is how you add things to it. This is how you do stuff, and they were able to pick that up quite quickly as well. So, um, you know, and just being with them in person, just sat around the table and me really showing them how to do things, it was, it worked really well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What were kind of the initial UX design that Adam envisioned for that Wasabi 1.0? So, um, Adam had produced some uh, kinds of diagrams and, and sketches about how he wanted different things to work, how he wanted people to be able to send Bitcoin and people to be able to choose how to do coin join. Um, um, you know, in the beginning as well, obviously all of this stuff was, was new to me. So, uh, it was quite difficult for me to, to understand. So it was kind of, I was mainly taking that and implementing it more or less as it was because I, without understanding what it's actually doing, it's too difficult to, to be able to put input in on the, on the design. So that's how the, the first design came about. It was kind of like a, it was an implementation from um, Adam's ideas and, and, and work. Uh huh. Um, one of the things that impressed me from day one when I saw the Wasabi UI was the coin list and this this list of the unspent transaction outputs that you have available to spend. Uh, Wasabi was one of the probably the first wallet who made it, like the exclusive way to to send your coins. Right, you have to select them, uh, and you see all these coins. Uh, other wallets like the Concord Electrum now have opt-in coin lists, but in Wasabi, this really was a core. And that's just one of the examples where I think Wasabi is like very honest about how Bitcoin actually works. Um, and it, like, it doesn't lie or keep important information from its users. But it's, it's interesting that you say that you had no experience in Bitcoin before and you had no clue how it is, yet still you developed a graphical user interface that was very honest in how Bitcoin actually works. Yeah, so um, I, I from 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 doing that, obviously I've learned quite a lot. Don't know everything still about Bitcoin, but yeah, you have to learn pretty quickly to to be able to do that. Um, but then again, as well, you know, I, I was w- also working from designs and sketches that that Adam um, had given me. So I, you know, I I could see roughly the ideas that he was trying to convey, and and then putting that into you know sort of putting the, the meat on the bones and, and fleshing out the ideas and putting together the UI. Yeah, yeah. Now, one of the things where I absolutely hated Hidden Wallet uh, was white mode. There was no dark mode at all. And it was horrible. <laughs> and, uh, that was one of the first feature requests I made. Please, no white mode. I protect my eyes. I want to see in the long and distant future still. And then Wasabi 1.0 came out with dark mode. Uh, and actually the only option was to use it with dark mode. There wasn't even a toggle to white mode. Uh, no, first of all, thank you very much for doing that. Probably the best decision ever made in the project. <laughs> but why was that decision made? Why the dark mode? Well, uh, the, the default for the shell that we based on was dark mode. Um, you know, it came from an ID and, um, most or significant amount of coders like to have dark mode because you're reading text all the time you don't want the bright light you know it's, it's like sitting in front of a lamp otherwise for eight hours a day yeah. <laughs> so that was kind of the default and and it looked good you know and um 
there was no reason really to have anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, funnily, in uh, the source code, you can actually change to the white theme, um, and it, it works, but it looks ah, kind of odd. Um, so even though it was kind of supported by the framework, it was never really done in the production shipped, uh, like package itself. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we could have always had the, we always had the option or the ability to, to allow the user to switch, but it, it almost became like the, it almost sort of became a part of Wasabi being the, 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 the dark mode. It almost became an identifying feature of it, I think. So. Yeah. 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 Very much. Uh, I think so too. So the, the, the first version of Wasabi 1.0 had a really, really good user interface, I would say. And it's been rather consistent for, well, up to this point, basically. Um, but where did you see the, the biggest changes in the UI over these last two years? Oh, that's a good question. Where do you, uh, where do you think, Max? <laughs> for me, so I, I kind of classified the Wasabi history so far, um, in hidden wallets. Which was like a way to figure out the, the design and the coin join and like the, the network level privacy and all of this. And this was basically done in Hidden Wallet. Um, Hidden Wallet focused on developing that. Then we released Wasabi 1.0 where we had this user interface and it was really good. Like it, good enough. It, it did what it was supposed to, um, and looked pretty. Uh, but I don't really think that there was too much of a, effort or, or uh, focus to change the UI and the UX at, at this stage of Wasabi 1.0. And I would classify actually what we're in right now, building Wasabi 2.0, where we focus on UI and UX. And no longer on the stability and performance and reliability uh, that was the focus in Wasabi 1.0. So I, I think that um, once we got to the Wasabi 1.0, a lot of what was going on was refining and stabilizing and, and making sure that things worked on as many different um operating systems and um different um laptops as and hardware as possible. Um so we were not really trying to make huge changes to the UI and the UX. We were trying to keep things working and, and fixing bugs. And then eventually we got to the point where things were really stable, um things were working um Nicely, we had a really solid base. Um, people started talking about, okay, what can we do with this now? You know, what can we add? So I think one of the, the biggest changes that was made to the UX since the original was adding support for multiple wallets. Um, so this was, this, uh, this was a huge change. And yeah. it, it's something that when the, the first version was done, I'm not even sure if that was taken into consideration when we were first doing the whole whole UI. So um people can manage multiple wallets, but there's some maybe some UI things that are not that work so great great with it. And um Yeah, like for example the tabs, right? And initially yeah. Wasabi had tabs send, receive, coin join, history settings, I think. Um but there was only one wallet, right? So you only had one send tab, one receive yeah. tab, and so on. Now we added multi-wallet support, and now you can have three sent tabs open. But how did you differentiate which tab is what? Um, I'm actually not sure if we figured out that problem up to this point. <laughs> yeah, there was, at the time there was lots of ideas uh, thrown around, color coding, and not having the tabs all together, and people like the tabs and stuff. So the fundamental issue is that we've we've kind of we've ended up with sort of some slightly redundant UI concepts in there that. Are, technically not needed and and after a while after that um you know people got used to it and people started talking about other features and things that we can do with wasabi and um it started getting to the point where okay we can maybe we might have gone as far as we can with the the current ui and 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 as well it's important to remember that in the beginning there were no there was not many users for um, Wasabi, and it was, I guess, it, it was kind of an experiment. Uh, I don't think anybody could have imagined that it was going to get to where it's got today. You know, 
maybe Adam did, you know. But <laughs> I didn't imagine. I didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't have done. I quickly realized that it probably was going to be once I started to understand it. Um, so in, in that case, the, the current UI that it's got has served a very important purpose, which is it, it got us up and running very quickly. It's got, um, it's become stable reasonably quickly and lots of people are using it. But now it's got to the point where, okay, right, we're now this, we're now this successful wallet and we're able to provide all these features. If we, would we have done the UI the same now mm -hmm. if, if we'd known this was the position we were going to be in a few years ago? And in my opinion, we would have had similar concepts, but the UI would probably be quite different. Which is, which is why we 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 we've started work on uh, Wasabi Wallet Two, and we've we've got. Um, um, the, the great thing is now we've got lots of resources. So we've got UI designers, UX designers, team, a, a whole team just for the UX and implementing that. And, and that's the, the, the direction that we're going in now. Yeah. I think, you know, as we spoke earlier about the multi wallet support, this really was, is probably the best example of the feature creep uh, that happens and how this can ruin the UI and UX. And Wasabi worked great with a single wallet. Now you have two wallets or multi wallets. And that ruins the entire concept of having the tabs, right? Uh, or at least it's, it's no longer as trivial. And that was quite a disruptive change. So yeah, would we have built Wasabi in that way? Had we known, uh, that eventually we will be at this point where we are now? Well, I mean, I, I personally think it was still a stepping stone. It was vitally important to have this UI. And again, it oh, was yes. good enough, right? It, it worked. It was, it was pretty. And, um, yeah. Plus, I, well, well, the thing is, I'm, I kind of gotten used to it, right? When, when you see the same UI all the time, of course, you know, where is what and where are all the quirks and hidden features. But then I was always like, whenever I tried to onboard somebody new to Wasabi, I could not just give them the software package and say, here, download, install it. Everything will be clear yeah. to you. That was just impossible. No, I had to be there and walk them step by step through everything, uh, to, uh, kind of at least guide them with what to look at first, right? Because there was so much um, all over the place. Yeah. Um, so originally, as well, the the this the sort of people who were adopting it, the early adopters, they were already quite technical users. They understood about um, the principles of con joining, and um, they're usually very um, enthusiastic and uh, usually quite involved in the Bitcoin community. So for them, they, it was like, oh, great, we're just finding some software that we can actually do all these things that we've been talking about and theorizing for so long. So for those people, the UI were, was great. Although now, really, the, the mission for Wasabi is to bring the privacy benefits to anybody who wanted to use Bitcoin. So... That's still those same users that we're talking about just now, the early adopters, the people who really understand Bitcoin, but it's also people who were like in my position at the beginning, who Bitcoin's completely new to them and, and okay, they don't understand, they understand the, the, the high level concepts. Okay. I'm going to send some value from one person to another, but they don't really know what the blockchain is or what coin joining is and things like that. We need to make Wasabi and, and, and fundamentally those privacy available to them without them having to, you know, without them having to have a degree in it <laughs> first. At yeah. least we want to make it, uh, intuitive for mm -hmm. everybody. Yeah. And I think there were some parts in the Wasabi 1.0 UX and UI where this was really, really, really well done. Uh, for example, when, like in the receive tab, Right there, you can generate an address, but as soon as there gets Bitcoin sent to this address, it's removed from the graphical user interface. Right? Mm -hmm. I do like most wallets don't do that. Um, but Wasabi did, right? And this is a very intuitive way to, um, prevent address reuse. And if the address is no longer visible, well, you're probably not going to send money to it again. Yes. Um, and, and I bet you any new user to Bitcoin, because 
this happened to me the first time that, I, you know, if I was using like maybe Coinbase or something, it gives you that address. And then you're thinking like, is that like my address, like my email address? It's always the same one or, you know, can I use it again? Or it's sort of just left for you to figure out, you know, but because Wasabi, you, you, uh, you receive and then it disappears, you know, okay, I'll create another one. Not that you couldn't actually reuse that address, but it, it guides you to, you should use a different address every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or things like mandatory labeling of the addresses, right? uh, that the user creates his own metadata about the coins that he has and yeah. where he got them from. And that's, uh, that, that's very intuitively inside Wasabi of 1.0 already. But then, for example, in Wasabi 1.0, um, there is no default privacy on the transaction layer because per default, Wasabi makes no coin joins. Right? Um, there needs to be a user interaction for that person to make a coin join. Now, who, which user actually knows that there is a problem of not making a coin join and that coin join, doing a coin join fixes that problem? Right? Very few users get to that point. Uh, and then again, in the Wasabi UI, right, you have the, the coin join tab somewhere up in the corner. But maybe you don't even click on it, right? So there were a lot of UX hurdles before the user could get the privacy benefits of CoinJoin. Yes. Um, yeah, it wasn't happening. There's a cost to getting the privacy. It's not, um, it's not automatic. And, and as well, you, if you're downloading Wasabi today, you're probably doing it because you know about the privacy issues. But a lot of people who are new to Bitcoin, they, Probably, maybe even assume that Bitcoin is anon anonymous, which uh, it, it's not really. You know, it's everything's recorded and visible on the blockchain. Anybody can see the transactions that you've made, and technically, they can find out how much you got in your wallet. And you know, it, 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 this is why Wasabi is here is to try and undo that or to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you mentioned earlier. Uh, well, that Wasabi 1.0 was basically designed by Lucas, uh, Adam, and you in over a couple of weeks. And now that with Wasabi 2.0, there is just much more resources uh, to go around. Um, so, what, uh, five developers working on it just to implement it, plus the UI and UX designer. Um, but where do you see the difference of kind of the, the hacky work in progress of Wasabi 1.0 and now the much more sophisticated and resource-intensive process of Wasabi 2.0? Yeah, it, it's completely different. They, now we, we start from a design. Um, we'll spend a lot of time on the design, refining, um, how the UI is going to look, how it's going to be laid out, uh, how the user is going to interact with it and, and what the user experience is around a certain feature or of the, the product. So there's a, a lot more. Um, there's a lot more time available and, you know, we're not, we're not rushing to, to get to the next conference in a few weeks. You know, we, we, <laughs> we've got months, you know, to, to spend on it. So I, I hope that when we release, people will be able to, to feel that, oh, this is a lot more refined. Um, that's certainly what we're, we're trying to spend our efforts in, in, and producing something that feels like that. Yeah, and I see a small parallel here. Right in Wasabi 1.0, you were kind of the newcomer to Bitcoin, working on the UI. Um, while with Wasabi 2.0, as I understand it, the designer that is on the team has also no clue about Bitcoin. Um, so do you think that's a feature or a bug? No, because we, um, we, we, we've separated, um, what I call UI and UX. So with the UI, it's like, how does a button look? How does a form look and, and laid out? So, um, but the, the UX the user experience is, is more the important things of, you know, how, which information should we collect and which, inf what information should we present to the user and when to give them the best and, and easiest, uh, route to privacy in the, in the um in the in the software so the ux we we we're usually sketching out first in like a wireframe 
then we'll pass that to the UI designer and he'll make it look really pretty, you know? So <laughs> or fill in all the colors and make it all look really, really nice. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and the benefit is he's starting to understand more about Bitcoin. So almost, like you say, it almost mirrors my experience a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, so, so maybe we can say that for the UX design, you kind of do need to understand Bitcoin. And what is the information you need from the user and, and what should you, what information should you give to the user? Quite difficult questions to answer if you don't know anything about Bitcoin. Right? Yeah. Um, but with the UI itself, you know, just to make something look pretty, uh, that's maybe something where you, where it's okay to not know too much about Bitcoin. Yeah, I think so. And even with the, the UX, there's the, there's certain things that, um, me and Adam have worked on together because it's so fundamental to the, the privacy and, you know, especially around like sending and coin joining. And I think people will, will see that and when it's released that there's some nice, there's some nice, uh, things coming around in those areas that have, that's come out from of that collaboration. Um, but yeah, you definitely, especially with the UX, you definitely need the, the experts and, uh, in, in the, to, to really work out those areas. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> it's, it's weird because right now I'm, I'm at this really weird state. I, I love wasabi and I have been shilling wasabi to everyone that I know for years, right? And always did so happily. But, but <laughs> now you start the work on wasabi 2.0 design and I see the work in progress, right? And I see where we're at right now and where it might even go in the future. And now I look back at the old wasabi user interface that I loved so much and I'm like, Wow, this is so ugly. <laughs> Please stop. <laughs> so I'm, I'm at this point where I'm struggling to recommend Wasabi to people because we're still at Wasabi 1.0 and <laughs> not yet at 2.0. Uh, so I'm, I'm so eager uh, to, to ship uh, this version finally, hopefully soon. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how uh, long it's going to take because the, the approach that we're taking is it will take as, as long as it takes really. Um, we'd rather not rush things. We'd rather get things right, um, before we release. Um, but that being said, I kind of hope that the, the new, um, user experience and the new design will not be completely unfamiliar to somebody who's used the existing software. I think it will still remain fairly, uh, true to, um, to the, to the existing design and, and people will, They'll, they'll, they'll find areas where they say, Oh yeah, that's the same concept. Yeah. I recognize that. Oh, great. It does this bit much better than the old one. Oh, I like that, you know? So mm-hmm. I hope that's what uh, the way people will feel about it. Well, time will tell. Yeah. Right. That's so difficult. Uh, like hidden bullet was basically only for Adam. I don't think he wanted anyone else to use it. <laughs> right. But then Wasabi 1.0 was kind of for the Bitcoin power users. And really, like, uh, very nuanced. You could do so many things. Um, kind of scary for, for an outsider. Um, but for a power user, once you got used to it, you just fell in love because it does exactly what you want it to do. Mm. Now with Wasabi 1.0, we have a different target audience, right? It's more like the everyday user who doesn't know all the details about Bitcoin. He doesn't care about to know the details of privacy. He just wants to have a wallet to send and receive Bitcoin privately. That's it, right? But now we have like, we move away from that first target audience, the power users, to that second target audience, and pretty much everyone, right? But how do we make that, that switch, right? How do we not piss off the power users because their favorite features are missing? And how do we not confuse the newcomers by making Wasabi 2.0 too clunky and too difficult to use it? Yeah. So it's important to highlight is that we're not moving away from our user base. We are. We're again, we're trying to open it up to an additional user base. So it's something that we talked about within the team at length and we're really making sure that the existing users will find all the functionality that they have right now, albeit it may be in a slightly different place or it may be in the, the same place. So I don't believe power users will be disappointed. They might have to, uh, find where something has moved to but i think once they get used to it they'll they'll find that everything is, is still there um and and we, we, we've kind of got concepts of 
a, a section of the software and um, a normal everyday user, one of the new um, target users that we're going for, will intuitively see what it is. But if you're a power user, you should find some something that you can click on in that part of the UI that find that gives you that feature that you were that you were used to in the past. So I, I hope that um, that power users will 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 be will be happy with the way that we've we've managed that. Yeah. Uh, I well, I th- I think I might be a, a good uh, case example here uh, because I would say I am a power user of Wasabi and I absolutely love the new design. It's really, really great. And we're not even done with it. There's still much more better things to come. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, it kind of ties in together with the work that we did under the hood, um, right, to have automatic coin joins in the background. right? And then this means that a wallet all of a sudden has, by default, uh, high-quality anonymity set coins, right, private bitcoins. Now, when your wallet has some private coins, then, for example, coin selection in, in the send tab becomes kind of meaningless, right? Because you yeah. just choose the private coins and those are being sent, right? So the, um, there, there's no longer a problem of needing to choose the right coins. And if you choose the wrong coins, you're going to mess up with privacy, right? That was kind of in Wasabi 1.0 with opt in coin join. But now if coin, if, if many coins are coin joined already and you have a, a, a set of high quality private coins to choose from, well, then we can make the so-called simple send. Right? The user does not need to worry about which coins to choose. We just want the address, the amount, and the fee priority, and that's it. And so we, we reduce the steps. And even for a power user, it's all right, because the power user knows, well, all the work is already done. Um, I could not do anything better than the software now. I would also just choose one of the private coins. Yeah, so it, it's it's basically this is what we're building pretty much right now, and uh, we... We really would like it so that the, the the almost like default way of using the wallet will guide you into the best um, available privacy that the current situation in your wallet allows. So that means that everyday users that don't know that much about Bitcoin, they'll sort of fall into the into the direction of uh, of doing that by default. Um, but then again, we'll still allow um, power users to there'll be there'll be ways for them to manually select everything, but they will hopefully learn quite quickly that most of the time they might not need that because um, Wasabi Wallet will be will be guiding them to making them suitable decisions, and it won't be doing that without letting you know. Like other wallets will just select random coins from your wallet and, and make the transaction. Wasabi Wallet will be letting you know exactly the privacy implement, uh, implications of a particular transaction. So you'll, you'll still be in full control. And uh, I think that that should remove the, one of the issues that you, you kind of hinted at with um, the current software is that it, it kind of gives you so much freedom of choice that um, it allows you to do things that are, that are even worse for your privacy than, than just sending uh, a transaction blindly anyway, you know, by selecting the wrong coins or, Mixing two coins that must not be mixed together. So, hopefully, that's one of the things that's going to be addressed with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Specifically like with coin selection, there are, there's are so many things that you can kind of mess up, uh, even for power users. Um, I mean, for example, Adam uh, told the story once that he used the Bitcoin Core wallet uh, and he meticulously labeled all his addresses all his transactions, made sure to always separate his clusters and so on. Right? But it was a lot of hard work uh, and the software didn't incentivize doing it. Right? And it wasn't mandatory either. Um, and then, for example, he selected all the coins and he wanted to send a sub, like a, a small amount. He didn't even want to send the entire amount, but he just did not care about coin selection. So he just selected all and sent a small amount to an address. Well, what Bitcoin Core did was to build a transaction that includes all of these inputs or all of these coins in the input of the transaction, um, therefore revealing that they were owned by the same person. Mm. Right? So Adam spends years on having a nice, clear wallet where he doesn't mix his, uh, like, doesn't cluster his coins, and then he just wants to save some time and not worry about manual coin selection, right? 
and he selects all, thinking that uh, Core will do the coin selection, but it doesn't. It just includes all of them in the input. So another example where the the, the wallet provides you so much freedom that it can shoot you in the foot. Right? And this is, for example, what he used in the Wasabi 1.0 design already. If you select all of your coins and then you send an amount, Wasabi will not just blindly put all of these coins in the input of the transaction. It will still do a coin selection. Uh, and if there are some coins that don't need to be in this transaction, well, they will not be. Uh, saving exactly from that use case of revealing all uh, all this ownership. So, um, yeah, too much freedom can be a bad thing. You can shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's important for it to be available when you really need it. But if it's the, it's probably not not ideal to have it to be the the default use case because then you know, yeah, you can shoot yourself in the foot for sure. Yeah, and I can come up with with countless cool ideas where you could use this feature that every coin that you selected comes into the input of the transaction. Very nice feature, right? Um, but some like sometimes, yes, you want to use that. But usually, you want the wallet to check if what you're doing is stupid and yeah. prevent you from making that stupid mistake. Yeah. So then we, we spoke about a lot, like your history before Bitcoin, uh, how you got into uh, like hardware programming and, and GUI programming and then Avalonia, and how that ultimately led you to contributing to Wasabi and now leading that monumental effort uh, of designing Wasabi 2.0. Um, but are there any other things that, that you find valuable uh, in the sense of designing a uh, high privacy uh, Bitcoin wallet. Well, I think that um, what people, if people are going to 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 start using Bitcoin more and more in everyday life, then you know people people you know have used fear and they have bank accounts. They um, you know they they know that their neighbor can't look in their bank account and see what they've been buying and, and things like that. You know so. At least you should, I think to get wide adoption where it is used in daily life, you need to at least achieve that level of, uh, of privacy where at least you only know what's in your account and, and not anybody else, which, um, some people, if you're new to Bitcoin, you might be surprised to know that if you send somebody, the mon- um, some, some, some money, then they can immediately see where you got that from uh, and probably how much is it total in your wallet. So for me, yeah, I think it's by implementing the, this new, this, this new UI and allowing those mixing technologies to be more widely adopted. Hopefully it can solve that. And then if, if that can be solved, then, you know, things could, could change, you know, I mean, a digital currency that that is uh, flexible and, and, and private and and, and 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 easy to use potentially, then that has huge uh, huge consequences and huge potential benefits for everyday life, really. Yeah, yeah, I very much agree. Like, it's a shame that Bitcoin is not private by default, or well, let's say that Bitcoin wallets. Are not private by default, but I do believe that we can build a Bitcoin wallet that is private by default and that provides sufficient uh, privacy and choice for the user. It just has to be built, <laughs> and it's not easy for sure, uh, and it's a lot of work. Uh, but I think Wasabi is on a pretty good path. Uh, it it was a very very private wallet for power users uh, in the 1.0 era, and I'm I'm really looking forward uh, to Wasabi 2.0. And to give this very powerful tool to more users <laughs> without them shooting themselves in the foot uh, in the first five seconds. <laughs> um, uh, but, but yes, it's, it's a, a quite important work. Uh, and I think we're doing a decent job at it though. Yeah. And there's, there's quite a few of us working on it now. So hopefully, you know, I guess every few years we're getting closer and closer to, to be becoming real. So. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, w- one more question to bring this back to an earlier part of the conversation where you said that when contributing to free software, it's always a bit, you know, tricky to get people on board and to get people voluntarily to contribute. And, and one of the things that I love about Wasabi, uh, is that Adam figured out a business model for it. 
there's a company and it gets paid for people using a part uh, or like a specific feature in the software. And this enables the company well, to grow and to be pro prosperous and well to hire people. So where are we now? Like I think 30 developers or something on board uh, being paid. That's quite substantial. Um, and like, what, what are your thoughts on that financial aspect uh, and what it means for fostering long-term sustainable development in free software? Yeah, well, I think obviously with um, with Wasabi, you know, there's 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 an obvious business model there, and it works really well, and it benefits the people who use the software. With um, other projects, it's not always that easy to find a business model, but if you can, um, it is really uh, it does make it all the work more worthwhile, and it gives you more of a chance of of you know like long term survival of a, a project um so yeah i i, I know with uh, avalonia um for example they they will sell to commercial entities support and stuff so so like avalonia has managed to build a, a business model around, around it which is helping it, it become more widely adopted and, and become more successful as well so there's always some business models that can be found. The Wasabi one's been extremely successful, but um, with, with other ones, it might might take a bit more. But yeah, if if that can happen, that's that's really great. I mean, for me personally, being able to work on on Wasabi, you know, it's it's given me a lot of freedom in my life, and uh, you know, I'm able to work from home now. Um, I'm able to pick and choose my hours and. Um, so it, it's had huge benefits for pretty much everyone involved in it, which is mm -hmm. really, a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I very much agree. Uh, it's, it's like, it's a sustainable project. It really is. And, yeah. uh, uh, users are happy and they're willing to pay. And this gets developers paid and contributors, meaning they build better software for the users, which makes them happy in turn. Uh, it's, it's a very nice, uh, system. And, uh, I think a very, uh, like a prosperous circle uh, spiraling upwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, it's it's really nice to see uh, <clears throat> like a, a business sort of grow from from almost nothing and just from a few people's sort of hard work. And, and now it's it's not just benefiting them; it's actually, you know, everybody that's involved with it is they're all, all benefiting from the success, which is something that you don't always see with a lot of businesses. You know, it's. People just get paid as minimum possible for their time and, and that's it. But with Wasabi, everybody's sort of getting taken along with it. So it's, I, I've, I, I feel really lucky to be involved with that, to, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very much the same. Uh, th there's one other point that I actually want to bring up. Um, and this is that for me, always that relationship between Wasabi and Avalonia was like, such a beautiful example of collaboration among free software and the upstream dependencies. And so Wasabi uses Avalonia. So Avalonia is the upstream dependency. Um, and like there were so countless times, countless times where there was some problem in Wasabi, some button was glitching or some weird things were happening. Um, but it, it wasn't even possible for Wasabi or it wasn't possible to fix that problem in Wasabi. Because the problem was actually in Avalonia. But because this is a, a free software ecosystem, we could just, you know, open a bug report, basically. Um, and even often fix it ourselves, right? Or then collaborate with other contributors to the upstream project, uh, to fix that issue. Um, so how do you see that collaboration between upstream and downstream uh, dependencies? Yeah. Well, with, um, Wasabi, Wasabi's really, uh, has originally been an early adopter of Avalonia and, um, with Wasabi, uh, um, building and, and testing on Avalonia, they, both projects have benefited for each, each other because <clears throat> a lot of the, the testing and feedback and bug fixing that Wasabi has provided to Avalonia has mean that Avalonia itself has become more stable, which meant that, um, the other companies and other open source and, and other developers have been able to adopt Avalonia because they were they were all able to benefit from the the time and effort that the um, that Wasabi has has put put into it. So it it's kind of like a a cycle, really, you know. 
And now, you know, more people are using Avalonia. They're going for the same thing that in the area that they're using in Avalonia. They're, they're testing and stabilizing and everything's just growing from there. So it's almost like the, you know, the success of one of the projects is helping the success of the other one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. Like quite beautiful. Um, and you know, this, this again can, can even come with financial incentives. Uh, there were a couple of cases. Where, for example, I had terrible issues with, with cubes, uh, specifically the clipboard, um, yeah. because cubes has a operating system, has a weird clipboard management and was completely broken in, in Avalonia and Wasabi. Um, and then we collaborated and actually hired, uh, Kek, 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 Kex, if I remember his name. Yeah. Um, Nikki is the, the guy behind it. <laughs> yeah. And the cool thing is actually gotten him, gotten him paid, uh, to yeah. investigate and fix that problem. It was quite a, a nasty and deep one somewhere in the nuances of code. Um, and it was difficult work to find the problem and to fix it. Well, but because Wasabi is a, is a profitable venture, uh, and free software, it could actually give some of that kickback, not just to a contributor to Wasabi, but actually to contributors of the upstream dependency of Alonia. Exactly. And that's just beautiful. Then, so we really did cover quite a lot of ground here. Uh, I'm really happy with that conversation. I learned a lot about your history and, and, uh, your, yeah, your, your path, uh, from, from hardware to graphical user interfaces to Bitcoin, uh, to Wasabi to Wasabi 2.0. Uh, I'm, I'm super happy to have you on the team. Uh, really, Wasabi would be, uh, n- not where it is here uh, without you. Uh, so mm-hmm. thanks very much for all the, all the tireless contributions that you've made. Uh, they are very much appreciated for sure. Well, that's very kind of you to say, Max, and uh, yeah, that, that was great talking to you, and uh, I'm surprised how much ground we actually covered in the end, so yeah, no, that was great. Thank you very much. It never gets boring in the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Uh, I could blabber about all of this for hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but then I won't hold you any longer. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Join the Wasabicas, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Uh, and again, thanks for all the contributions, and keep it up. Wasabi 2.0 is looking absolutely stellar. Thank you. Thank you, Max.